What is a disciple? Think about that for a moment. What, what comes to mind? I want to throw a couple ideas out. When you think of, hear the word disciple, uh, do you think of a uh, bunch of sandal-wearing, robe-wearing, robe bearded guys who trekked up and down Israel following Jesus for three years? Uh, is, that, is that what a disciple is? What, what, what is a disciple when you think of the word? Ben? Follower of Christ. D? Okay. Jonathan? Okay, Ron. Okay, Judy. Okay, Duck Dynasty. Duck Dynasty. <laughs> they don't wear sandals though. So, uh, <laughs> as we start this new sermon series about discipleship and about becoming. The people God has called us to be as, uh, as his followers. We're going to start with that question. What is a disciple? And maybe if you think about disciples, the first thing that comes to mind are some names. If you are like most people, if you talked about the, the disciples, the first name that came to mind would be Peter. And I found out through some study this week, the second most thought of name when they think of the disciples is Judas Iscariot. Uh, but maybe you think of names, these 12 guys, Matthew, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, which in parentheses, they also are known by these other names in Scripture, Bartholomew, James, John, Simon the Zealot, Thaddeus, who was also Jude, Thomas, Peter, Judas Iscariot, James the son of Alphaeus, who was James the less. We think of those 12 guys. But I, I got a couple things I want to run at you before we get into the message. These are two axioms that we need to grab onto. All apostles are disciples, not all disciples are apostles. Okay? We need to remember that because a disciple, when you use the word disciple, it means more than just the twelve. And if you think about the ministry of Jesus, you will think about there are a lot of people who followed him. And so the second thing we need to be aware of, all disciples are followers. Not all followers are disciples. Th those are important concepts because I think in a lot of ways we kind of confuse those in, in our thinking. And, and I was in reading this week and came across a sermon by David Hicks based on Matthew 8. And he provided a, a good contrast between a follower and a disciple that looks like this. Uh, he says followers, if you read Matthew 8, tend to want the help Jesus can give. A disciple wants Jesus. Followers enjoy listening to Jesus. Disciples want to think, pray, and live like Jesus. Followers want a Savior to rescue them from their problems. Disciples long for a king to rule over their lives. Followers received help and then went on their way. Disciples give up everything to be with Jesus and join him in his work. And I don't know where that D came from. So what is a disciple? Uh, we're going to ask two questions. It may sound redundant, but we're going to start with the question, what is a disciple? Uh, we begin simply with the word, and Ron kind of nailed it on the head when, when he said the word disciple means student or apprentice. Uh, there is a word that's closely associated that we need to put with, with disciple when we, we talk about it. We, we need to use the word discipline as well. Now, when you hear the word discipline, in our vocabulary, in our way of thinking, what do you think of? Punishment. When I think of discipline, I think of the switch my mom used to bring out when I did something wrong to get me back on the right track. 
But discipline actually means one who has been taught. A disciplined person is one who has been taught, learned the lesson, and is now living them out. So a disciple is one who is being disciplined, taught by another, a student or apprentice. Their desire is to be like their teacher. Uh, in Jesus' day, the culture of that day, uh, an, a disciple would choose a rabbi. They, well, they would, they would express a desire to follow a rabbi. And they would uh, let him know that. But the rabbi was the one who would actually choose a disciple. And they would be called to go with him everywhere. Follow him, listen to him, watch the way he lived, and become like him in every way possible. But in simple terms, it's one who desires to be like their teacher. Hey, I want to be like Mike was a phrase from the 80s when Michael Jordan was playing basketball. I want to be like him. A, dis a disciple is one who is not content just to follow and watch and observe, but one whose intent is to be like them, to think like them, to understand the way they see life and apply that. Oops, let's back up for a moment. And I think in some ways we have forgotten that. Uh, Francis Chan, in the book we're working through, kind of uh, challenges us with that. He says, somehow, many have come to believe that a person be a Christian without being like Christ. A follower who doesn't follow, how does that make any sense? Many people in the church have decided to take the name of Christ and nothing else. This would be like Jesus walking up to those first disciples and saying, hey, would you guys uh, mind identifying yourselves with me in some way? Don't worry, I don't actually care if you do anything I do or change your lifestyle at all. I'm just looking for people who are willing to say they believe in me and call themselves Christian. Doesn't sound what Jesus would say, does it? And yet sometimes I think in the church today we have adopted that mentality that I'm a Christian because... I come to church on Sunday morning. Jesus calls us to be disciples, and a disciple is more than just a follower. And so that brings us to the second question. We're going to spend a little more time on this one. The question is, how does one become a disciple? Now, I mentioned just a moment ago, becoming a disciple always began with a call from a rabbi. I could express my desire. I could say, boy, I'd like to be your follower. I'd like to, to walk with you and learn from you. I'd like to become like you. But every rabbi chose the people who would follow him. He would examine their life. He would question them. He would spend some time with them. And when he figured out they may be worthy to be his disciple and, and would be uh, quality students then that he would go to those individuals and say, yeah, come, come follow me. It wasn't easy to become a disciple of most rabbis. Now, if you think about Jesus and those who followed him, those who became his disciples, it didn't seem that he was very discerning and uh, very selective, does it? I mean, he didn't choose the best. He didn't choose the brightest. He called those who were weak and those who were, were less, people would look at and say, what was he thinking? But a call from the rabbi, a call has to be extended. And we find that in Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 22, we find Jesus walking along the sh uh, shore of Galilee and he finds Andrew and, he, and Peter and they're mending nets or fishing and he says, come follow me. He called them, be my disciple, and I'll make you fishers of men. He goes down the beach a bit further, finds James and John mending nets, and says, come follow me. Come be my disciple. In Matthew 9, 9, we find the account of Matthew sitting at his tax collector table, and he's raking in the cash, and Jesus walks by and says, Matthew, come follow me. And then in John 1, 43... There we find Philip 
And Philip, Jesus talks to Philip and he says, follow me. In order to become a disciple, there has to be a call issued. And for us to be a disciple, we have to hear a call on our hearts from Jesus saying, come, follow me. Now, if you look at the disciples we already mentioned, it's obvious that Jesus issues the call to each and every one. Jesus wants everyone to be his disciples, but before we do that, we personally have to hear that call upon our lives, and we have to accept that call. Uh, No rabbi ever forced anyone to be his disciple, and Jesus doesn't force us to be his disciples. So what what does it require? How does one become a disciple? First, My response to the call, I accept that call because I believe in that rabbi. Becoming a disciple of Jesus requires believing who Jesus, or Jesus is who we are told he was. You catch on to that? That becoming a disciple of Jesus requires somebody else telling us about Jesus. And coming to that place in our lives that we say, yeah, I believe in him. I want you to go to John chapter 1 with me. And look at verses 29 through 42 because it provides a great example of what that looks like. Talking about John the Baptist, this next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Remember, he's saying this to the people who are listening to him. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. And verse 35, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, who, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Do you see the connection? Do you you see that connection between hearing and believing? Andrew believed because John had told him. Why did Peter believe? Because Andrew told him. Accepting that call requires coming to that point in my life that I believe Jesus is who I was told he was. I believe he's the Son of God. I believe he is... The Savior, I believe He is everything and will do everything He has said He will do. So there's a belief. The second thing is a change in life and lifestyle. If you go back to those three calls that we looked at, we, we look at Peter and Andrew. Andrew and Peter. What did they do? They dropped their nets and immediately followed Jesus. James and John dropped what they were doing immediately, followed Jesus. Now, they did go back to them from time to time, but it was a life change, a change of lifestyle. You look at Matthew sitting at his tax collector booth. What does Matthew do? He doesn't say, well, give me a week and I'll close up business and I'll come follow you, does he? He, Immediately, he gets up from his tax collector booth and walks away, never looking back. Andrew goes and finds somebody else and brings them to Jesus. Philip goes and finds a man by the name of Nathaniel and brings him 
to Jesus. Coming to Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus requires a change in life and lifestyle. For some of us, it may require a complete change in career. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and Matthew, and Philip walked away from their careers and began a new life as, I will say, as, as apostles and missionaries. And sometimes discipleship, a disciple will hear that call and will change careers. Right, Fred? You'll hear that call and you'll know that I can't do what I'm doing now. I have to do what Jesus wants me to do. But that doesn't happen in everybody's life. It doesn't happen in the life of every disciple. Remember I said, all apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. The apostles gave, had a career. But it requires a change in life and lifestyle. And the Bible has a word for that. Repentance. Which literally means to turn. Interesting connection. I, I said Matthew 4, 18 through 22 talks about the first four disciples called. Go to the verse right before that, Matthew 4, 17. What does Jesus say? Anybody have their Bible open? Jesus says these words. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then immediately he goes to Peter and Andrew, James and John. That, he's talking about what is repentance other than a change? It means to literally turn. It means to change my lifestyle, change my life, to begin living differently. Now there's a lot of changes that are going to happen in our lives as, as a disciple. The first is it means to turn to Jesus as Savior. It means a change in the way I live, the way I think. And if we talk about mankind, what is the one characteristic that all men have in common? We are sinners. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we are unable to satisfy God. We cannot reconcile that relationship with Him. Because in Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. So for me to have a relationship with God, I have to resolve that sin issue in my life. And I can't do that on my own power. If you read Romans 3, he says none of us are ever justified or can be justified by keeping the law. So we have a problem. I have an issue that separates me from God. And by the way, Romans 6.23, next time you're tempted to say, I want what I deserve, keep that in mind. Because, because Romans 6.23 leads us right into the greatest news of all. It says the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. There's the good news. That I have a problem. I am at odds. I, and, and the Bible talks about being at war with God. And I can't resolve that. But God in His mercy, God in His love for me, took it upon himself to make it possible to resolve the issue. And in Romans 3.24, in those verses following, it says God satisfied his justice through having Jesus die on a cross. While we were yet sinners, Romans 5.8, Christ died for us. What we couldn't fix, God fixed. And becoming a disciple is recognizing who Jesus is, that he is the one who died on a cross. He was buried in a tomb, and he raised from the dead. And I need the salvation only he can provide. And Paul in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 makes it very clear that it's all about grace. It's by faith through grace that we are saved. It's not my merit. So the first change in my life, the first active change I have to make is to turn to Jesus and make him Savior. To say, I 
want the forgiveness only he can give. So a disciple is one who lives with Jesus as Savior, having made the payment that I could never make. Second thing is to turn to him as Lord. Romans 10.9 says you confess Jesus as Lord. What, what do you think of when you hear the word Lord? We always hear it in connection with God and we think, well, that's his second name. Master. Lord is a title, not a name. Lord means owner. Lord means master. Lord means authority. The one who has the right to tell me what to do. Now we're getting into a whole new territory. Because it's one thing to have Jesus as Savior, but it's another th an entirely different thing to have him as Lord. Because Lord implies worship. Lord implies obedience. You see, if somebody's my master, if somebody's my owner, if someone is my king, what do I do when he gives me a command? Obey. You see, I can claim all day that Jesus is my Lord, but if I don't obey, it, it means nothing. Look at John 14, verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And Luke 6, 46 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I ask or command. I think a lot of us are captured in that little loop right there that we say these things and we proclaim these things and yet the obedience factor may say something entirely different. Is Jesus Lord? Is Jesus Lord of our lives? I, I made a connection this week that I have not made in my entire life. Matthew 4, 18 through 22 talks about calling the four, first four disciples. Then there's that little part about him crossing over the sea. And Matthew 5 begins what? The Sermon on the Mount. For the next three chapters, Jesus teaches people about what it means to be kingdom citizens. And as I was looking at those, the proximity of those verses all together, I recognized something. Jesus goes from calling the first four disciples to telling them what their life is going to be like. For three chapters, he goes on about changing the thought process and the life process of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And in Matthew 5.22, he kind of gives us a clue about what that is. When he says, your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. What was the righteousness of the Pharisees? Rules. Checklists. Telling other people what to do and binding heavy laws upon them and regulations. And, and Jesus said, not lifting a finger to help bear it. And in another place he said, do what the Pharisees say not what they do because they don't follow their own rules. The Pharisees had a list of what it took to be acceptable in God's sight. And if we were honest, most of us have a list. Most of us would make a list of what it means to be loyal and faithful to God. And it's interesting, Jesus said, you want to be my disciple, you want me as Lord? then here's what it takes. Two things. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Number one, love God. With every ounce of your being, love God. Second of all, love your neighbor as yourself. Two commands. What a cinch. Simple. Simple. Notice I said simple, not easy. You see, 
Being a disciple of God means, or Jesus means that I love God and enjoy God and want a relationship with God. I just revel in being with God. And the way I demonstrate that love for God is to demonstrate my love towards others. You look at those passages in 1 John 4, 20. And and you know what? Sometimes I just resent John all to pieces. Because he makes it so practical. He writes these words in 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And then verses 16 and 17 of 1 John 3, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Love God, love man. How do you know if Jesus is Lord of your life? I'm in church every Sunday. I read my Bible every day. How do you know if you're a disciple of Jesus and Jesus is Lord of your life? Come on, folks, this isn't hard. I love God with all my life and all my heart, everything about me. And I love others. Is Jesus Lord? (laughs) It's all about grace, brother. But it's all about about the intent of the heart as well. Found some, I saw something on Facebook. You know, most of the time on Facebook, I just skim through it because it's a lot of drivel. But there was one that says, if you're thinking about the plan for your life, just love God and love others in the meantime. Two commands. Did you, you ever have your mother or somebody say, I gave you one thing to do. <laughs> Only one thing, and you couldn't do it. Jesus says, I've given you two things to do. Simple. Not easy. What is a disciple? Someone who has turned their life over to Jesus as Savior. Never to walk in sin again. With the intent of honoring and serving Him and making Him Lord. You have to make Jesus Savior and Lord. You can't have Jesus as Savior and not have Him as Lord. You can't have Him as Lord if He's not Savior. It's it's a package deal. And a disciple is one who has said, I will live for Jesus. What is a disciple? How do you become a disciple? We talked about obedience. and, And perhaps one of the things we need to touch on is the fact that becoming coming into that salvation that he has given us requires obedience. It requires, we've talked about it. It talks about a willingness to repent, to change my life. It talks about a willingness to confess him before men and to by my life and by my words. It requires an obedience to baptism, to be obedient, to imitate him in his death, burial, and resurrection. It requires an obedience in my daily life. Can I be a disciple without being obedient to all that he's commanded me? It takes obedience. Discipleship is really pretty simple, folks. But it's not too easy. In fact, Jesus said, uh, you better think about it. Look at Matthew 14, 25 through 33 with me. Luke 14. I, I know what, what we're talking about. It's pretty basic. 
I mean, most of us have heard this a hundred times before. But maybe this is the time that makes a difference. Some of us are hearing for the first time. Verse 25, Jesus said, large, or the, Luke writes, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to co complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation with the other or while the other is still a long way off, and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus was just really too narrow, wasn't he? What does it take to be a disciple? Everything. Completely surrendered life. And the call is issued. In the story of the wedding feast, it says that the king went out and invited everybody to come to the feast who would come. Then he came into the, came into the uh, wedding hall and he found one man not dressed appropriately. And threw him out. And Jesus ended that story with these words, many are chosen, called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? I think simply this, that God is calling everyone to come follow him. But only those who are willing to choose to become obedient to him and do all that he asks can be his disciples. And you go on to that story, it says that man was taken out and thrown into the darkness where they're weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not a pleasant picture. But we have to decide. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 tells us Jesus is the most successful preacher to ever live on earth. You know that? He took a church of 5,000 and grew it to 12. Because he was teaching his disciples about what it means to eat the bread and drink the water and eat of him and eat of his body and drink his blood. And in John 6.60 6, it says they turned to each other and said this is a difficult teaching. Who can accept it? And then verse 66 says from that time on many of his disciples turned and no longer walked with him. He was just asking too much. And then he turned to the twelve and he said, do you want to leave? And what's Peter's response? Where, where would I go? Where would we, you, you are the only one who has the words of life. You're the only one who offers hope. Why would we leave you? Why would we abandon you? We trust you. And so the question we come down to is, is simply this. What will you decide? Who will you be? Will you be the individual who says, man, you are just asked, Jesus asks too much, and, and I just got to walk away? Or will you be the individual who says, where else could I go? Where else could I find hope? Where else could I find salvation? Where else can I find forgiveness of sin? I am staking. And I'm going to change my life. I'm going to turn to him as my savior. Maybe for the first time. Maybe again for a hundredth time. And I'm going to turn to him as Lord. And I'm going to commit my life to doing everything he commands me to do. Because without that, 
Jesus says, you can't be my disciple. You can be a follower, but you'll never be a disciple. So what will you decide as Jesus calls today? Father, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for the fact that in Jesus' ministry there were a lot of followers and and Jesus was fine with that because he knew followers can be turned into disciples. And he kept calling, he kept working, he kept teaching, and many of them, eventually hundreds, became disciples. And Lord, today we live in a world where people have heard the call, and our world is filled with millions of people who are disciples. Lord, you're the only one who knows whether we're disciples or followers today. So I'm asking that you would work in our hearts, speak in our ear, open our eyes to the reality of our life. And where change needs to be made, let change be made. Let us truly become disciples of Christ. Whose desire is to love God and love others and to become like Jesus in everything we do. And join him in his work. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your faithfulness and your patience. In Jesus' name, amen. In the morning.